first of all, let's start mm -hmm. with the documentary itself yes. okay. and the Pendleton 2. Okay. Start with um, what happened, in your opinion, to them. They call me the King Trill. And I'm just another black man who's done a long time in prison. So as you can imagine, I already know about the oppression and injustice of the system, but all too often, the injustice and brutality are so blatantly in your face that sometimes you feel like you can't breathe. In fact, I was in prison when I watched George Floyd murdered by an arrogant killer on live television. And instantly I was reminded of how dangerous this country is for people who look like me. But then I thought about the other people who happened to be in the unfortunate position of having to stand there and watch as a man dies. And this is not to judge anyone. I mean, who could possibly know the proper protocol on how to proceed when police kill common people right in front of our very eyes. But nevertheless, I wondered, what would I have done? Could I have just stood there while a man with more similarities to me than differences is killed in the street? But regardless of the outcome, I still ask myself that question. And I had to be honest. I realized that I truly didn't know if I had the courage to risk my life to save another. That is a special kind of courage of which I wanted to see an example. And I found it. In fact, I found it specifically in two men who risked their lives to save the life of a friend. February the 1st, 1985, um, me and my co-defendant, John Cole, we were, um, what were we supposed to be, which was on that lockup unit at that time, uh, going to a CAB hearing, and um, there was a disturbance on the lockup unit. The first thing we noticed was the smell of mace. And then that I had already served time on the lockup unit, I knew what that meant, especially when, they, when the curtain was pulled. I knew that there was some form of terrorism going on. Mm -hmm. And that organization consisted of raising the consciousness of prisoners, organizing, educating, and educating prisoners to form a self-defense committee. Because that was the only defense that we had. It was the Black Dragons. What the Black Dragons really was standing for, too, is this. You know, a lot of us had knew each other from the streets. You see what I'm saying? At a young age. So if you come into prison, and you ain't got no help from your family, we would get together and get what we call care packages. Mm -hmm. You know, we get together, you know, we might, I throw in $10 worth of commissary, this person throw in something, you know what I mean, to make sure, you know, cause you're just coming in, so you're gonna need soap, you're gonna need deodorant, you know, you're gonna need et cetera, et cetera. So we was trying to touch each other like that too. We're a new breed of prisoners, you know, we've been politicized, you know, 
we understood, you know, uh, 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 colonialism, you know, and, and we just had a whole different mindset and what everybody else was going for, we weren't going for. And, you know, that probably led to them singling my brother out, Lincoln Love, and, and beating him like they did. Why does it always feel like black people have to fight two, three, even 10 times harder than the average person just to get the decency that we deserve as human beings. They can never just give it to us because it's the right thing to do. We always got to force their hand. But if I wanted to know more about the courage of the Pendleton too, I had to start at the beginning. What is your relationship with uh, he's, my, he's my cousin, my mother and his mother are sisters. Can you tell us what type of upbringing he had? Okay, he had a very good upbringing. He loved animals. Uh, I've never seen him fight anybody. Okay. He was a good kid. He was a good kid. I was separated when I was seven. Eight years old, I lived, you know, I, I used to spend weekdays with my mother and the weekends with my father. I started getting in trouble when I was about nine. Uh, kind of like got, a, you know, addicted to that lifestyle and went from juvenile to boys' school, from boys' school to jail, from jail to prison. Messing around, just doing that shit for about five and a half years, and then after five and a half years, I, I embarked upon, you know, some self education, self discovery, and, you know, political this. You know, we got political sides, you know, we uh, started educating ourselves for uh, uh, reading about our history, our culture, uh, you know, and all the isms. And right. it, was, it was in that context, after I developed that mindset, that I got transferred to Cain in 86. When the riot took place in 85, shortly after that, his sentence got extended for decades. Yeah. 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 Uh, when that yeah. happened, can you tell me what the impact to the family was like? It was kind of devastating. When we found out that he, you know, that they gave him a, a longer sentence, I mean, I think at that time it was, he had already lost his brother first. Oh boy. I think, and then he lost his mom. And it was just, it was devastating, you know? I always said that. I would never change my phone number. Right. So he'll always have somebody to call. Yes, ma'am. And to this day, my phone number is still the same. I grew up in a, in a household of four brothers and three sisters. Um, my father was an alcoholic. My mother was a God-fearing woman. How did that abuse affect you? That abuse affected me because I was the overprotective big brother. You know, I was the defender. I was the one that would protect my mom from my father's uh, violent attacks. I was the one that would protect my little brothers from his physical abuse. You know, uh, I was the fighter in the family. You know, so I've always had this mentality of being protective of people. He stood for something that was, that a lot of people don't stand for, and that's being fair. He's been like that ever since before he even entered the institution. He always been like that, no matter what an individual is doing, no matter who you are or whatever, you have to be done fair. I wouldn't say he got in trouble, trouble came in. He went to, 
you know, he tried to escape it a little bit. He went to the National Guard, I mean, to the Army, right. and re-enlisted to the Army, went to the Army, but he, he, and the Army had that same type of mentality that he did on the outside. At least for African Americans, the way the drill sergeant treats you and talk to you and get up in your face and right. stuff like that. He, he wasn't, he thought that maybe going to the Army that will maybe give him a different course and a different outlook on life, but right. it really gave him the same outlook that he that he had when he was out here in the streets. I came out the military. I was working. I I ended up getting a petty theft case. I was uh, working at a um, Target supermarket and. You know, stupid stuff. We make stupid decisions. I was loading stuff off the dock to my friends and got caught up in a sting operation. I didn't feel I was hurting no one, but it was wrong nonetheless. I took responsibility, pled guilty to it, received a four-year sentence. I'm like, hold it, wait a minute. How does a young man that served his country, that's a military vet, there's never been locked up for a felon in a day in his life. We see four years the maximum sentence for petty theft. And this is the reality. Had I been a white person, I would have never seen the inside of a prison with a petty theft case, first time, first offense. It's time that he has been in there, he realized, if I don't stand up, and I leave, this will still be going on. So he actually put his life into that. But um, at the time, he, he did what he had to do. I was serving a four year sentence with just three months left before my time was up to return back to society. I was put in a position, either go home in three months or save the life of a fellow human being. I chose to save the life of a fellow human being because it was morally the right thing to do. Another brother that uh, I'd always, I would always hear about, named Logmar, I would always hear about him. He, you know, he's well known. You know, he's one of the leader type brothers, you know, uh, you know, and always uh, trying to do something progressive, uh, uh, you know, educating. I mean, you know, he, his name, man, it always rang on the positive level, you know, or, or leadership type of level, you know. Yeah, Logmar. Man, Logmar was, was like a professor, a scholar. Man, the coldest man, you know, out of all the cats out of this since I've been incarcerated, Lil' Man was probably preeminent in number one dude. He had a hell of a man, man. You know, when he came to this law, he got about 37 dudes out of here. The thing was, he didn't want nothing in return. He kept on getting the out. You know? Yeah, he's a red brother, man. Yes, sir. What rehabilitated me was another prisoner. And it came out to listen to me. You say, hey, you need to read this right here. What the first piece I ever read was the of uh, Malcolm X. Malcolm was able to change his life. But it took somebody to give him that book to listen to him, not just dismiss his struggle. And that person that actually gave me that book was Lincoln Love. He was one of the first people I met when I came to prison. And the inmate that uh, was actually, actually beaten, that got beaten, uh, was a good friend of, of Chris. Uh, they was gotcha. great friends. Great friends. Great friends. Okay. And, and uh, Chris' mentality and way of thinking, and when he got into it with others, the way of thinking was, that's Chris right there. Uh -oh. Want me to go ahead? Yeah, yeah take it. What, what happened that day was, was they, had a, they had a disturbance on the lockup unit where they didn't allow the inmates to have their recreation. So the inmates, they asked to speak to someone. You know, and 
know. And so they went around with fixing someone. So they got to, you know, they 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 they're trying to get someone down here. Hey, tell us, let us have tell us why y'all won't give us our recognition. You know? But Sam, they want to use this as an opportunity now to come in on certain individuals yeah. that they had on their list. Lincoln Love was one of those individuals that had previously got into a altercation with one of their clans. The next day I go see him as Lee Adams because I'm a representative, you know, and, 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 and uh, they said, no, you can't come in. They said, no, because they had an incident last night and they had to uh, shake down the whole unit. Big R's down there at the time. Big R was there. He's down there. He's down there in that lockup unit. They shook us down three or four times that day. For security reasons, they always would use that. Safety and security at the institution. Right. This is a totally segregated unit, you know. It, right, it so no high, it's no you, threat nowhere. You're behind two doors, three doors, you know. So, but you knew what that meant, shakedown time, that's, that's coming up in it. We kind of found, found this odd that we had got shook down this many times in, let's say, maybe four or five hours of time. But we didn't have nothing. Underwear, shower shoes, maybe a t-shirt. So it was unreasonable for them to even go in a cell hey man. a second, third time looking for anything anyway. I mean, think about it. If you limit it, what are you looking for? You know, we didn't been over and squatted. You know what I mean? You coughing when you been down, you know what I mean? You, you know, you can't even hide nothing. You see what I'm saying? So man, you know, then it became obvious. Oh, this is harassment. This is targeting somebody. He was right across from me, making love, Lomar. Now what I do know for sure, the particular sergeant that ran that unit was a sergeant named Sergeant Lane. Sergeant Lane wouldn't have let him come down there three or four times because Sergeant Lane wanted to try to keep peace on the unit. Sergeant Lane and this particular brother that they target, they had like a court, prisoner guard court. Sergeant Lane kind of respected his space and he kind of respected Sergeant Lane's space. So we noticed this particular day, Sergeant Lane was off. So they trying to do all they dirt quick and in a hurry. I was with Lane Adams, that's somebody that, you know, uh, yeah. uh, represent other prisoners or inmates at the conduct of uh, disciplinary force. Yes, sir. And so, I was supposed to be down on that unit to represent a few of my comrades who had conduct reports sending the kitchen for, you know, for some disciplinary action that they got run up for. Okay. And so when I went down there to represent them this particular morning, the officers told me to get away from there, that they were not army or no, you know, no, no, no CAB passes that day. Okay. So I leave. This third time they came down there in a matter of hours. They ride here, you know, and this and that. Now they lined up outside no more cell. Now keep in mind, you didn't pass up four or five more cells, but you had no more cell. We in the middle. You got some more cells before you get to us. Why you lined up outside that brother's cell? As I seen him going to no more cell, he didn't see what I seen on the side of the wall. It was some more guards lined up, sticks, Shields, helmets, you know, ready to do battle. They lined up, man. They got uh, looked like guns and, and all type of stuff. They went in on the brother, had him subdued, had him handcuffed. And what really caused this riot this particular day, once he was handcuffed, one of the guards took the sticks and hit him in his head. Blood gashed out of his head. I'm right there. I got tears in my eyes because I tell him, look, give me some of that just to take them off of him. So one of the guards said, don't worry about it. Y'all got some of that coming. You know what I mean? He said, what's up? So I look over there, no blood gushing out of the brother's head, cuffed behind his back, man. They beat him down into a pass with a, with a solid oak club. Once they beat him, they drug him out of his cell and then drug him down the range of the tier, he did, uh, the, the tier of the range for all the other prisoners to see. Uh, everybody thought he was dead. They thought he was dead. I'm witnessing it. I said, hey, man, the dude is already handcuffed. Why y'all hit me with them sticks like that? 
And he ain't even moving it. I can see the inside of his cell. He ain't even moving. I'm thinking they didn't kill him. Can you imagine getting hit in the head with them sticks? Why? Blood gushing out. And while you cut behind your back, you can't even get up. I mean, it was devastating. I'm telling you. I'm giving y'all the watered down version. It was devastating. As we sat there for a few minutes, listening to the disturbance, prisoners started to holler. They're killing me in love. They're killing me. They're killing me. So a few of us hollered up to the front. Now the guys in the front came out in population. You know, that side, our side of the unit, you can see the kitchen and maybe another cell. How, hey man, somebody go uh, tell, hey man, they're trying to kill us down here. And on that particular morning when I tried to go to that unit, because I was supposed to be representing somebody, I couldn't get through. They had a curtain pulled. And when they, when, and when they pulled the curtain, the curtain symbolizes that they back there beating somebody. But as I was leaving, I heard a brother screaming out the window, you know, go get Dollar Green. And so another little brother named Kevin Murphy ran and got me and told me what had happened. Right, so when he came and got me, I turned around and came back. Once John Coleman got the word of what's taking place, somewhere down that line, him and his brother named Christopher Trotter met up. So now they come and trying to see what's going on in this particular unit. Now, I'll try to wasn't to commit violence. It was to try to go to the administration and say, hey, y'all need to stop this. And so once we once we got there, they took on again a uh, defensive uh, position. And at that particular time they still had the inmate handcuffed and shackled Lincoln Love in a back room and they were beating him with a baseball bat. I found out 25 to 30 that the people that are the and right correctional guard that the man went back and forth from the Capitol office to the military. Yeah. Well, I, I know where to write that, so to speak. When Officer Richardson now, Captain Bean, if you were once, they said, what do you want us to do with the inmate? The officer talking to their security. Their security said, kill the son of a bitch. These are court documents. These are court documents. These are facts. Right. You know, six to them seeing that, brother. And I had to see them change, start coming from everywhere. I mean, I'm talking about, I ain't never seen so many change converged on so few people, right? Right. They were converging on us. Right. I feel this about them. They had some hearts. You know what I'm saying? They were scared, right? And I think the only thing that really stopped them from coming in on us over the radio, they heard that it, it was a riot, but they had to rush off the unit to kind of support whatever else was going on. Now, at this point, when we come to the defense of Lincoln Love, which is the fruit of a third person, now we're hunting. Now it's all about our survival. So now we went from being on, you know, the offensive to the defensive, right? Right. So we know that we can't let them take us alive because they're going to kill us, you know? Right. Well, we're in the end of these shows, you know what I'm saying? They're asking guards to shoot us, to kill us. One officer refused to do so. That was in the tower, refused to shoot us. It was lacing us and trying to beat us with them clubs. And at the time, you know what I'm saying? We, 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 we were, you know, we were stressed to, you know, stab them. Well, in the process of stabbing them, we was asking about his brother. Unbeknown to me, the superintendent that made his way to the infirmary and he was in the room that they got Lincoln Lab at this particular time treatment, doing x rays and administer treatment. I don't know it. So I'm trying to open this door, and, but the door won't open. But it, mysteriously, the door wasn't locked. It wasn't locked. It was open. It just wasn't open for me. Right. And it's a good thing that it didn't open because the warden was there with a guard and he was armed with a shotgun. And we opened that door and gained entry to that room where they had no bar 
and it probably blew us away. Now the glory of God, they do it with nothing. Once they try to get over into their unit, them guards start locking down certain parts of the unit where they couldn't get back. And so because the door wasn't open, uh, a COs was coming from everywhere. And they had kind of like corralled us in their front. Well, they came through the back entrance and the front entrance. Now we're forced to be able to fight our way up out of there. Just imagine that. Imagine that. This, this, this was that environment at that particular time. Once, once we got back out there on, on, on the compound, we ran towards the guard hall. And, and by the grace of God, I was able to get away, right? And once I get to the guard hall steps, we try to turn around and see that I'm locked out. So that's when we grabbed the guard Force him to open the door and let him in. The second of a fair house, because we wanted to take over the fair house, it was to seek refuge. Because had they caught us right there and there, they would have killed us. Remember once we took over the Jay Fair House, you know, all the other prisoners, you know, come out of the cell and, you know, just fell in line. I went to that phone and I called WTLC. The radio station. The radio station. I called WTLC and I'm telling them what's going on right now. And this is why it's going on. And uh, they they wouldn't believe me at first. And I just kept talking to them. I said, man, please, please come up here. Please come up here because they'll kill us if you don't. So I kept stressing that, you know, and they said, OK, we're on our way. And I guess they notified other media, too. But see, if you think about it, these brothers, your trotters, your balagoon, was trying to shed some light. And it couldn't be from them, it had to be from the world. So the National Guards had to come in. This is the only way you're gonna get some attention on this. Cause they gonna keep everything in house. You feel me? They gonna, they gonna keep it all in house. But once you once you get the uprise and the, the ride, now you're bringing in outside force. Somebody's gonna look into something. Hey, what took place up in here? What's really going on up in here? There was unity amongst all prisoners to challenge the condition. Did they do away with the inhumane treatment of prisoners? Did they provide health care? Did they provide sensitivity uh, training? Did they hire more black staff? Pay, pay wage increase. More recreation, better food. Uh, uh, we were we more all the time. They were us poor practically every day. So we wanted, you know, one fair and beef and mm -hmm. you know, other, you know, turkey and stuff like that. And, you know, we you know we brought up all of that, right? You know, we had a document. I signed it, uh, coach signed it, try to sign it, superintendent signed it, a major signed it, you know. Everybody kind of signed it, you know, and it was like, Okay, you know, and, and, you know, I think back, man, I was like, we kind of felt like, you know, maybe we get something done. And we would have asked if the governor sign it. And so there was somebody like the governor, I don't know if the governor came or not, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but somebody from the governor's office signed it, you know, and this is supposed to be okay, this is what we're gonna do. Okay, so you guys signed it, they signed it, what happens after that? Okay, uh, you know, he said, uh, they gotta let the houses go. I said, well, that's what we agreed to, right? So I picked up the phone, and that's so why I said, hey, uh, and everything was signed, you know, let the hostages go. And that's what happened, man. You know, we were in that old Mexican house with maybe 13, 14 and a half hours, right? Yes. And the rest of the time and stuff, but no physical replacements was going to be taken against us. If it had been that we let the, you know, our hostage go, once this document that you guys drew up along with the administration, everybody read it, everybody revised it, had a chance to speak, terms are drawn, conclusions are made, everybody signs, everything's agreed on. You take them in good faith and at their word that these things will be addressed and you guys live up to your role in these terms and release the hostages. And, and during this time, let me point this out, man, them guards were never on. That was part of it too. We are gonna put them in a spot. Cause you know, other inmates don't be thinking it like, the, you know, everybody ain't thinking it in conjunction. Some of the inmates wanna kill the guards. I knew that if something would happen to me, I'm dead. 
But yet we felt it was our responsibility to put them in place and actually put some inmates around them. We put them in cells, but nobody could go in them cells. Nobody can, you know, go in there and mess with them. You know what I mean? Because there's people that want to do something to them guys. Man. And y'all kept them guys safe. Safe up in the corner, yeah, and, and had the inmates around them and made sure nobody else would mess with them. Well, but that's how they win, bro. That's how they win. Yes, sir. Yeah, they amnesty, but they won't give us no amnesty, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. We'll give it back to the guy. Definitely. You know, we wouldn't just do it unless, you know what I'm saying, just to be doing it. You know, we had to do that to survive. The Indiana Reformatory is an artificial environment that usually brings out the worst in a person placed therein. The overcrowding conditions that have captured federal court's attention are responsible in part for the stress. Attitudes of personnel, meaning guards, towards inmates tend to be abrasive in the extreme. One of the officers involved in the beating that set off the riot in this cause is now in federal prison for that beating. The Indiana Reformatory is sometimes likened to a jungle and wow. with reason. This is the state's free sentence investigator. These are not my words. When we became aware of, they had their own, the guards had their own inside clique, so to speak. It was discovered later uh, that there was a group of officers who called themselves the Sons of Light. Right. Yeah. We were fighting a uh, hell of injustice inside the Bill of the Beast. Came out later, they were white supremacists. White supremacists. Yeah, it came out that they were white supremacists. And, I, and like I said, at that particular time, I didn't know, probably didn't even know a whole lot about the white supremacists. You know what I mean? Didn't even know what we were really facing, to be totally honest. There was a clean thing organization called the Sons of Light, which was the offspring of the Ku Klux Klan. And these were prison officials who openly displayed their hatred towards black prisoners. Then, like I say, I think over the years, and the, the, the brothers went to trial and court, a lot of things started coming up. The officers started saying, well, I had orders from this one. No, that one over there told me to go in there, beat him up. And people say, how do we know what was going on? We know because we've been subjected to it ourselves. I had been subjected to it. I had five guards come in my cell while I was shackled and handcuffed. And one of them choked me out and said, nigga, we'll kill you. You know, when they had a plantation mentality down there. Mm -hmm. When we got down there, you know, it was like, you know, going to Mississippi, you know, because they didn't have no qualms about calling you nigga, you know, uh, out of all the staff and correctional or prison guards down there, I think it was only about four black officers. Everybody else was white. And, they had been there for 20, 30 years, and so the mindset that they had towards us was straight from the 40s, 50s, and the 60s. Like one day, I remember one day I was walking on the walks, and I happened to step off in the grass, and I heard a whistle. But I didn't pay no attention to the whistle. I thought a dog was supposed to answer that. I didn't answer it. So when the guard called up with me, I made it to the, uh, to the hospital in front of me. He said, did you hear me blowing that whistle? I said, I heard a whistle, but I didn't think he was blowing it for me. But you know, uh, I don't know you from around here, but when you hear that, as a matter of fact, you just stepped off. I said, yeah, I accidentally stepped off in the grass. I didn't know that, you know what I mean? I thought the grass was okay. It was pretty much understood that when those officers roll your bars, and they all suited up and booted up and they standing outside your cell, it's pretty understood that you about to get an ass whooping. It's a bear one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't no doubt about it. Sticks, man, these sticks were like, been around about uh, five feet, uh, 
uh, yeah, about four or five feet tall. And they come in beating you with that with two I hands? Automatically. You know, uh -huh. yeah, automatically. You know, it's automatic. And if they couldn't, the fella couldn't get a reach to they had the uh, rubber bullet. Uh, like, a, like a gun. It is a gun, but it just shoot rubber bullets. So when the Sons of Light are standing outside of your cell, you know that you're about to be in for the fight of your life. Right, right. And, and, and you know, I look back at it now, and he'd be like, what else can I do but, you know, fight back, man? These were guards that were all uh, part of the Sons of Light. The Sons of Light were so entrenched at the Indiana State Reformatory that that was their liturgy. That was the orientation for uh, new recruits, new guards. If they wasn't a part of the Sons of Light, they were basically ostracized, which was testified to by the one guard that was involved in the beating of Ricky Love, Michael Richardson. Is it right? No, this world ain't what I hope for. Risk my life for shit I ain't got nothing to show for. Uh, damn, this country leaving me no choice. No, no. I think they want me to be a dope boy. in the street young prince kept it together but could tell it cut him deep looked the judge in his eyes said i do that in my sleep judge said where here go 20 more they help you get back on your feet let's give moments of peace for those who dare to oppose police they're focused on their pieces more than focused on the peace got my mama scared that you gonna choke me in the street but ain't i just american as mr toby keith i'm not oblivious i know so many don't agree Engineering convinced you I'm your enemy. Souls deceased from the coca leaf. I saw you. Just to find everything that we said about the, you know, the, the, the beatings and the brutalization. He had seen something like this happening he did a couple of years before. And so he was one of the brave ones that went downstate and told them about how. This organization, the Sons of Light, was singling out black inmates. You surprised the Black Dragons as being a clandestine organization. That we were underground, just like they said the Black Panthers were. And they were able to publicize us in a revolutionary organization, but they didn't want to talk about the DOC in a organization. Later on that night, they had brought Lomar in, but he was, you know, still suffering from whatever beating he had got. As time went on, so then, you know, we had a chance to, hey man, you all right, bro? How you, you know, you mean? And he barely talking, you know. So it was definitely some type of change to his person from them. He didn't even he, he, he have them sticks. And I remember, man, uh, you know, they just kind of go back to your cell. Everybody go to the cell, you know. And it was quiet for days. They did not rush in there and they did not do nothing. So we kind of felt like, you know, you're sitting in the cell, you know, and people hollering back and forth. Like, okay, things are gonna change, man. Because, you know, immediately, in Pelton or most other press, when something happened like that, they, they right behind it, you know, with their guns and their, you know, sticks and shields and mace. After that happened, we all got transferred. From that unit, we got took into Michigan City. Next thing I know, uh, I'm being shipped out. Cole's being tripped up, shipped out, Charles being shipped out. And you guys were kept in the hole. Yeah, oh, ain't no doubt. We only came out of that cell handcuffed and shackled for a shower once a day. For how long? I you was down there three and a half years, and they were there with me. And then when they brothers went to trial, that's when some things started coming out. I think guards started telling them each other. Later on in the trial, it came out that they was talking. The brothers really loved no more. They got into one of one, one of the guards, I guess it was one of their brothers, so to speak, two or three weeks previous. And this is why we found out we think he was talking. 
on the get back tip. So tactically, when they extract it, make it love, oh, here's the opportunity now to get you to react, retaliate. The payback you for know? for a prior right, the payback incident. For, for a prior altercation that right. he had with one of their members. And they had orders to come down there and attack this brother, make it love. First time he give it a uh, refusal, or he don't want to do this, or he don't want to do that, going there on it. And as a result of uh, the riot, uh, the, the FBI and stuff like that got involved in investigating our civil rights abuses. And investigating our civil rights abuses, they discovered that there was a lot of uh, impropriety going on with the commissioner himself, Gordon, uh, Gordon Trump. Uh, he was even guilty of ghost employment and stuff like that. And he ended up getting fired. The deputy minister got fired. But in the, 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 the aftermath of him getting fired, me and Naeem got persecuted. The jury, which was an all-white jury, I, I, I believe that's very important. An all-white jury, hand-picked, out of Madison County, out of Elwood, Indiana, which most of the... Correctional officers were from Elwood, Indiana, and Elwood, Indiana has a history of Ku Klux Klan activity. Um, right. so, so, the, so, 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 so the people who were on the jury were actually from the same community as the guards were, and they were all okay. Yes, 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 yes. and there's, there's, there's no question in my mind that. Uh, they knew some of them. You know, one jury admitted that she did know them. Right. What happened was, you know, the state was so rich on such rules in this case that they didn't, they didn't give us a fair trial. Right. And all the evidence that we had that would collaborate or substantiate our defense they made sure that it never got before the jury. I was a um, political election where the judge fraternized with the all white jury, where the judge denied every motion that we brought up and granted every motion that the state raised, where the judge denied every objection that we made, but right? he granted every objection that the state made, where the judge openly fraternized with the jury. Right. The judge kept on ruling in their favor, and so we would only be allowed to make an offer of proof. That meant that these witnesses would be allowed to testify, but they wouldn't be allowed to testify to the jury clerk. Anything that they would testify to would be on a record, but the jury would never hear it, right? And please let me remind everybody, no one killed him in prison right here. At the same time he was convicted of charges, we were acquitted of charges. We were acquitted of every charge of attempted murder that involved any officer at the meeting of Lincoln Love. Why was that? Right. It was only because our actions were actually justified. And so uh, all the people that were considered to be credible, the ones that worked for the DOC or were, were, were correctional officers and uh, uh, employees and, you know, personnel and stuff like that. Right. All of them people, they had to let the jury hear them testify to collaborate our defense. We cannot let Cole and Schroeder be acquitted of these charges. What kind of message would have sent to the DOC and the rest of the prison population? Yes. Schroeder ended up with 142 years. He only had four. Uh, Mr. Cole ended up with 84 years.
you have different stages of violence. You know, I, I like to call them the four stages of violence. You have your initial colonial assault, then you have when people internalize that initial colonial assault, which is the second stage, and then you have that third stage where people become conscious. When we look at the Rodney King verdict and how people rebelled against that, they were becoming, they had become conscious of where. That's that third stage of violence. And then your fourth stage is when the state again comes back and represses. Life after that was hell. It was hell. Um, they transferred me and my co defendant John Cole, down to the farm where they had this maximum security lockup unit. And then the next thing I know, they would have the East Squad in front of my cell. And they would say, lock up, Trotter. You know, come and cut up. And I would say, cuff up for what? We said, cuff up. I said, I ain't do that. So once I would cuff up, they would open the cell door and, and, and rush me and throw me down and start to beat me with fire for time. You know, uh, beat my ankles, my groin area. And this went on almost twice a week. How long did this go on, these type of beatings where your bones were broken? How long did this go on? It, it went on until that one day I realized that, hey, they didn't care I didn't do nothing. And that was like almost six or seven months until I started fighting back. When I realized that they didn't care if I did anything or not, they were going to run in that cell, I stopped cutting, I stopped cutting up. And I fall back. I used all my military carry training and fall back. And I've had police tell me, I've had COs tell me once they got to know me. Man, you ain't nothing like, you know, I thought you was going to be. He said, you know, they take, he said, before I start working here, when I was being trained, they used to take and show us tapes of you. Miles Goodner and your Rappy Trotter, and they used to train us, showing us pictures and tapes of you guys, right? In other words, they was conditioning us to hate us, to hate you, before we even met you. When you lock up, who's who? It was designed to suppress, you know, any political activism that was taking place throughout the state. They wanted to take control back of the prisons. Well, when we got down at MCC, that's how they was playing us. We come out our cell, we had to come out, you know, with, with leg shackles on, uh, handcuffs on. They made us kneel down to get our shackles and shit on, right? And then they, you know, when they escorted us from my cell to the wreck, to the wreck uh, uh, area, you know, there was two police escorting us, you know. One here had a handcuff, one the other one had a baton, you know, with a piece of metal sticking out of it. So if in the event that, you know, when uh, 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 they had any problem with us, he could poke us in our ribs and separate our ribs, you know? Mm. And, you know, they, 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 
uh, uh, we was molested every day. You know, you couldn't come out without them checking you down and, you know, going and shit. You know? yeah. The only way we was able to tell the time of the day was by counting the meals that we got. Right. Right. MCC was one of the most treacherous lockup units I ever been on in my life. They would come back there with the extraction team and they would dog you out. They would put you in four way restraints. And four way restraints is, 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 is being restrained where they lay you in a bed, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they shackle your hands, you know, over your hands to the edge of the bed. And then at the same time, they, they shackle your ankles mm. to, you know, to, to, to the bed where you can't do nothing but lay on your back, mm. right? And you, you, you held there. Uh, they had hot and cold cell, you know? The, the cold cell where, you know, you didn't even have a blanket. And, and I, I'm talking about the cells were so cold that you were... You know, basically just sit up all night long and just shit. You're, you're on the borderline of hypothermia, you know? Now, not only when they put you in forward restraints, they also take your clothes. And so you ain't got nothing oh but God. a t-shirt and underwear. And, and, they, and, and, the, and the temperatures are frigid. They deliberately, you know what I'm saying, make sure that there's no heat coming in there. They got that coolant, central cooling system turned up on high. And so you being restrained like that, and you only have to be permitted to have your underwear and a t-shirt and them frigid temperatures, it's it's paramount to torture. Then they would move you to a hot cell. The cells would be so high, you're constantly irritable. And so when people get irritable, you, you get agitated, you start to, you know, you, you're so hyped, you, you, you're so frustrated that you're going to get to howling and screaming. And so that's what they wanted to do. That's what they wanted. So they could come in now with their squads and punish you, strip everything out your cell, you know. They were prepared to deal with us on the physical. Right. You know, it's very brilliant. And I always been recounting prisoners, you know, who would, you know, uh, go to war with the police, right? But in this particular setting, they was prepared to deal with us like that. So we knew we couldn't win those type of confrontations. So came up with this this idea of, man, we're gonna we're gonna starve our bodies. We're gonna go on a hunger strike. We struggled around the tortures unit at MCC. We got the attention of the federal government. Um, they came and had new guidelines for MCC. Some of it lasted almost to 30 days. Yeah. Successful demonstrations I'd ever been a part of. We was, we was demanding, you know, that, that, that the unit be shut down. Mm. You know, we demanded that the unit be shut down because it was, you know, it was inhumane the way in which they was treated. You had prisoners that cut off one of the prisoners, cut his finger off. Dudes actually cut their fingers off and put it in the mail and mailed it to the government. Because of the type of torturous oppression that existed at that time, we had to go to those extremes in order to get any type of attention. We went through that for about three, four years, man. And Till we got, you know, uh, the CLU and civil and human rights organization, you know, we, you know, we had, we got Amnesty International to come down there and 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 look at how we was being treated, and they wrote a hell of an expose on, you know, what was going on. You had cats, you know, that was losing their minds down there, start wiping feces and stuff all on their body and on their wall and cutting their wrists and shit. You know, it's a hard time. Once we got that lawsuit, they shut it down as part of a, a dissent decree settlement, mm. right? You know, they shut the unit down as part of a dissent decree with regards to the behavior modification aspect. 
then they just turned it into a regular lockup unit. And I did, this is what happened. At this particular time, you know, the, 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 the ICLU was negotiating the settlement for us. This is what the chumps did. They had a dude named Richard Raples. He was he was head of the ICLU at that particular time. He made a deal with the EOC that if they settled, lawsuit that, that, that they had against them about MCC that they would they wouldn't file suit about them, what they was doing to the prisoners down here in Chile. Well, they was fucking over dudes down here too. They got a deal and told them that if y'all settle with us about these issues that we have with y'all on how you would treat these prisoners down at MCC we won't sue y'all about what you're doing to the prisoners down at Wombash at the shoe, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, for so for years, it, they they mm -hmm. were to to this prisoners down here pass on the shoe with no fear of uh, uh, wearing about the CFU to bring suit against them. Yeah. Then they moved us up to the shoe, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, now you did go and say, we got to go through this whole process again. Mm -hmm. You did even start filing suits about how we're being treated down here again. On the shoe, it's a window of cell where you lock in the cell 24 hours a day. Everywhere you go, you're on a dog leash, you know? And. They, they train their officers on this shoe to be abusive. Their motto is, what happens in the shoe stays in the shoe. Some of the worstest things that I endured in the shoe was the sensory deprivation. It means that having the lights stay on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, not seeing the night sky. If you go outside in the wintertime, they would leave you out there in the bitter cold for five and six and seven hours and won't let you in. If you went to take a shower, they would leave you confined in a little shower for four or five hours before they come back and get you out of it. Oh my God. You know, these were some of the tactics that they would use on the shoe. I maintain my sanity it is, in, in other ways by reading. Now, I was reading about other people that went through similar experiences that I went through, and I drew strength from them. I read about the, uh, what the brothers was going through down in Philadelphia. Jamila, who, Jamal. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Cats was experiencing down there in Canada. Read about Bobby Sands over in the island. I, I wanted to maintain my sense of humanity. You know, at all costs. At all costs. I wanted to maintain my sense of humanity. You know, that's that inner God in us. You know, that allows us that no matter what you do to me, I'm not going to turn around and do it to you. Or I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of becoming that that you want me to be. Was we perfect type of prison? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, man, that everybody don't want to be shit on, so to speak. Excuse my language. They don't, everybody don't want to be shit on. Or you don't want nobody peeing on you telling you it's raining. This is the truth. Man, go out with the, no other avenue to aggression on businesses. You know, violence is bound to happen, you know? Right. We've done swipe everything, everything, everything. 
you know, violence is bound to happen. And for something in order for that to hit like that, uh, the mentality of, of other inmates, it had to be something similar to Chris mentality of, of the way he was thinking. That a lot of inmates was thinking that this is not acceptable. This is this shouldn't be happening. So you can't take over a penitentiary for with three people. Just like applied force. Doesn't give any type of relief from the dryness, and then all of a sudden you have a a lot of thunder hits. You got a you got a four star. All it takes is a star. But check it out, and that's the thing about it, man. I look back at it now. We were young, but we, you don't have no choice but to try to do something to do. You know, you want to stay alive. Okay, I'm a prisoner, and I'm in prison, but I, you want to stay alive. I'll never forget it, bro. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because like I say, I was the only human. Right. And all of us was kind of close-knit, you know, because that's all we had was each other. You know, uh, can you imagine you already in a penitentiary in prison and then every little thing that goes on in prison, you got to fight through these guards, man. And then they got the tier motives, they sell. You know, they don't, they don't want you to kind of stand upright and be the man you are. They want you to drop your head when they walk past. And just, some of us just wasn't made like that. So how do you feel now about having to go through life so long with, without having him there? Oh, empty. Sad. The only thing that bothers me about it is basically it's still, I don't understand why he is still there. Right. I mean, I don't, they can't give me a reason, you know, what... There's no reason he should still be in there. Knowing everything you know now, being a, a wiser, older man, what would you want to say to uh, John Cole and Chris Charter if they were sitting right here in this room with us today? Oh, man, you know what, uh, what I would say is what I want to always say. Uh, thank you, brothers. I mean, thank you for standing up for me. You stood up for other people. Uh, uh, but you made a sacrifice that, uh, man... I couldn't make, I didn't make it that time, you know, but, you know, uh, it was, I mean, man, it was spontaneous, but it was yet, it was, it was sincere. It was, it was dependent not only on themselves, but other people. You know, I hug them, I would hug them, man, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm getting kind of emotional about that. Yeah, that's, her, bro. that's some heavy stuff, man, you know, yeah. but, uh, but yeah. Well, all that particular day, I, I, I was I was three and a half years from being parole, right? Yes. But I'm not thinking about that. All I'm thinking about is being a brother to a brother, right? Yes. If I would allow them to murder this brother, and I did nothing, I wouldn't have been able to look myself in the mirror, bro. Yes. Ain't no way I can hold my head up. You know what I'm saying? He ripped up. Look myself in the mirror if I let them murder my brother. I right. cannot say I love you and I let them murder you. Right? And I was there to stop it. was sacrifice my life to do the right thing to help someone. Just imagine if people would have helped George Floyd instead of just standing around videoing it with cameras. He would be alive right today. 
freaking love is alive was alive that day. Plus, we stood up. So, if I could be convicted for standing up and saving a person's life, he convict me. But I know it was the morally the right thing to do. So, if they want to continue to be vindictive, and I will continue to fight. And I ask to fight with you. They were close to being released mm. and they were placed in impossible circumstances that they felt that they had to respond to.